Good evening, everyone. Good Lots evening. of people. Good evening. Oh, good. We're going to have a, 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 a vocal crowd tonight. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here to celebrate St. Patty's Day Eve with all of you. So I'm sure we have some Irish, we have some American, we have lots of Irish American. Um, so we're in for a special treat and a very special occasion here at the National Archives. My name is Jackie Bedell, and I work as a digital project specialist in research services here at the National Archives in DC. Welcome to the beautiful McGowan Theater and tonight's book discussion of the Forgotten Irish, Irish Immigrant Experiences in America with our special guests, the book's author, Damian Shields, and our co-moderators tonight are David T. Gleason and Michael Hussey. So welcome also to those of us who are watching uh, the National Archives program on YouTube today. Before we get to tonight's discussion, I'd like to mention that we will have time afterward for some questions. We ask that you use the microphones that are located on the stairways to either side of the theater. So we please ask that you'll hold your questions until the end of the discussion tonight. Um, there also will be a book signing after the program, which will take place in the theater lobby. So we do have a lot to look forward to tonight, and we hope that you'll be with us through the evening. I'd also like to take a moment to tell you about a few more programs that are upcoming here from our calendar of events. The first one is Wednesday, March 22nd at 7 p.m. The National Archives again partners with the Environmental Film Festival of the nation's capital for a screening of the 2016 documentary called Following Seas. And then the following Wednesday, March 29th at noon, we welcome author Jody Cantor, and she'll be here to discuss and sign her latest book, which is called Presidential Libraries as Performance, curating the American character from Herbert Hoover to George W. Bush. So you can learn about these programs and all of our public programs and exhibits by consulting our calendar of events. So we do have that available in print, or you can get it online at archives.gov. Um, there are copies in the lobby tonight, and you can also add your name to the sign-up sheet, and we will certainly mail out the calendar by regular mail or email, so we hope that you'll take advantage of that. Um, there's also brochures out there for other archives programs and activities, so please join us. So one more way to get involved with the National Archives um, that you may not know about is the National Archives Foundation. So they um, support our education and our outreach programs. So if you'd like to pick up an application um, for membership, those are also in the lobby, and you can sign up online at archivesfoundation.org. But nearest and dearest to my heart, of course, I will invite each of you to become researchers and explore the holdings here at the National Archives. So you can make discoveries for yourself and hopefully um, enrich the world's understanding of our shared history and our people. Our discussion moderators tonight have plenty of experience exploring the primary resources here at the Archives, um, certainly with different purpose, but with the same appreciation, really, for letting history speak to us directly um, and unfiltered from the past. So first we are joined tonight by David T. Gleason, who is certainly no stranger to this building as a researcher, but tonight marks his first appearance on the McGowan Theater stage. David is the professor of American history at the University Northumbria in Newcastle, England. He is a native of Ireland, and David is the author and editor of lots of books and articles, but his most recent is called The Green and the Gray. So the Irish and the Confederate States of America, that was published in 2013. We're also joined tonight by my colleague, Dr. Michael Hussey. Michael serves as our museum program manager for the National Archives DC Exhibits Office. He earned his PhD in American history at the University of Maryland College Park. And since joining the archives in 1993, he's worked closely with many historians and educators who are interested in exploring the wealth of our primary resources here. Michael has served as curator for the National Archives Rotunda, which I hope you have a chance to visit, and other major exhibits including Discovering the Civil War. He also worked on Benjamin Franklin, In Search of a Better World, and recently he served as the curator for the African American Civil Rights Wing, which is in the new permanent exhibit here called the Records of Rights. Um, I'm also glad to tell you Michael is the proud son of two Irish immigrants. So very appropriate tonight. 
Our guest author this evening discovered that the National Archives documented the story of a nation. Except Damian Shields discovered that the records at the US National Archives told the individual stories of his Irish homeland. Damian also discovered these records as a digital researcher. So he was accessing all of the National Archives digital collection of Civil War pension application files from his home across the Atlantic in Cork. His book, The Forgotten Irish, is a result of all that research. It really underscores the value of digitizing primary archival materials, and it certainly illustrates the importance of the National Archives collections to social historians who are working around the globe. The National Archives has a commitment to expand our digital access to its holdings and allowing social history literally to be rewritten in countries like Ireland. Researchers such as Damien utilize these records truly to give a voice to the estimated 180,000 soldiers who fought for the Union from Ireland in the American Civil War. But Damien also tells the story of the Irish soldier's widow or orphan or mother, father, or even sibling who was left behind either in Ireland or in the United States. And since the US is a nation largely of immigrants, National Archives records document our two nations' shared history. In fact, the files in this building document Irish social history with information that is available nowhere else on the planet. Indeed, I think every box in this building that holds just a portion of the 15 billion pieces of paper that we preserve here has a story. Every box has a story. We just need a few more storytellers. Damien Shields essentially works as a professional storyteller, both for his vocation and his avocation. He is currently employed in Ireland as a conflict archaeologist, and he previously worked as a curator at the National Museum of Ireland. He was part of the team that designed and prepared the award-winning military history exhibit that's called Soldiers and Chiefs. Damien lectures worldwide. Um, certainly mostly through Ireland, but now internationally, and he discusses both archaeological and historical topics. He's also appearing regularly now on Irish television and radio. In recent years, his lectures about the American Civil War, with a focus on the Irish, have nearly turned his avocation into a second full-time job. And it is the reason, really, he has amassed thousands of followers both on Facebook and on Twitter, and he has now acquired legions of eager readers to his blog posts. Um, he just earned the gold medal award in Ireland's blog awards in 2015. So in addition to The Forgotten Irish, he has also um, authored a book called The Irish and the American Civil War, which was published in 2014. Both titles were published by the History Press. So at this point, I would like um, you to join me in welcoming to our stage David Gleason and Michael Hussey, and our guest author, Damian Shields. Thank you, Jackie, for that uh, wonderful introduction, and thank you all for joining us uh, here this evening. Um, we, it, it's uh, quite a treat in store for you. I've had wonderful conversations with Damien and David back in the green room and yesterday, and uh, this will probably be the easiest moderator job I've ever had um, in my life. Um, so uh, just, just to, let's just jump right in. Um, so 180,000 Irishmen served on the Union side and about 20,000, David, on the Confederate side. How do, we, how do we know about them? What sort of... Um, research did you have to do to come to, the, to find out about them? Yeah, yeah well, I, I suppose it, it's worth starting by giving a, an overview of just, just why so many of them were here. That's yeah. what certainly piqued my interest in the American Civil War, first of all, because uh, many of you, I'm sure, are well aware of the, the famine, which is a, a huge event in Irish history when so many people emigrate. Um, over a, mo a million people have left Ireland in the early 1850s. And particularly in Ireland, that kind of story tends to get a bit left at, at the port. We don't follow these people. And that was what inspired me when I was working in the National Museum to have a look further into these stories. 
And immediately when you start looking, you see that the American Civil War is a conflict of immense importance for Irish people um, uh, everywhere, not just in the United States, but in um, Ireland as well, Sh based purely on the amount of people who fought in it. Um, it's our biggest war outside of, of World War I, and for many of all those counties um, where your family are from on the West Coast, it's the biggest war that ever was fought by, uh, by Irish people from those counties. So um, that was what piqued my interest in it. And then you start to look um, at, at the numbers of people fighting, particularly for the Union. Uh, David will talk maybe towards the Confederates in a minute. Um, but we see a, a, an analysis of figures that suggest that in and around 180,000 men fight um, in Union Blue during the war, that 20%, one in five of every Union sailor in the war is born in Ireland, um, that you have significant numbers of what I would call green flag ethnic regiments, particularly in states like New York, where if you walk down the street in New York in 1860 on the eve of the war, mm -hmm. one in every four people that you would have encountered on the street was born in Ireland. These are staggering numbers. It's the biggest Irish city in the world. And of course, this doesn't include, we're in a period where because of the events of the 1850s with things like the Know Nothing Party, anti-Catholicism going on, where the Irish are, are kind of drawn together even more so. They're an ethnic group uh, that tend to, to kind of stick together. And so when you start to think about the numbers, you're thinking about 180,000 Irish-born people, but you're, you then have to start thinking about the, the Irish step migrants all the people who went to England first and were born in England and then ended up in the United States who considered themselves Irish. All the people who went to Canada first were born in Canada and go to the United States and consider themselves Irish. Mm. And of course, all those in the United States who do the same thing. So when you start thinking about those numbers, you're really expanding into very, very significant numbers of people who likely identify themselves as Irish Americans. Mm. And we might talk a bit maybe um, later about, about their motivations and how they viewed themselves. But um, they're the type of numbers we have. Just on a, on a union perspective, they're, they're interesting, and it's one of the other interesting aspects to the pension files. We tend to concentrate all the time on the Irish Brigade, the very famous unit that fought in the Army of the Potomac Second Corps. Right. They're the ones that everybody, there's lots of books written about them. Right. They deserve an awful lot of attention. They were the, they were the media darlings of the Irish, Irish media even during the war. Mm -hmm. um, and they're the largest formation, along with another formation called Corcoran's Irish Legion, who fight for the Union. They were all New York regiments who were uh, very severely handled in, in 1864. Uh, and then we look at another, we look at there's, there's green flag regiments from other regiments in New York, Pennsylvania, Illinois, you name it, all over the place. Mm. What particularly interests me, though, is that they are not the majority Irish experience of the war. We tend to look at those units, those ones flying the green flag. They're the most vocal in writing afterwards, they're writing from an Irish perspective. But the vast bulk of the 180,000 men we're talking about, they, they didn't serve in those units. They served with everybody else in all these other New York units or wherever it may be, Massachusetts units. Yeah. And their experience is actually the typical one and they're the hardest to get at. And, and again, we, we, we'll be looking at some of the pension stuff later. But sure. um, yeah, that's certainly more or less it from the union. Yeah. Um, I mean, on, on the Confederate side, it's, it's the same story, but just on a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and, a, and a bit like Damien, when, when I came to graduate school at Mississippi State, interested in the South, and wasn't really coming to do Irish stuff, because I knew about the Irish in New York and the Irish in Boston and the Irish in Chicago, but there were Irish people in Mississippi, there were Irish people in South Carolina. Uh, really? <laughs> uh, apart from myself and the two priests uh, in, <laughs> at, in Starkville, Mississippi. But... Um, you know, so I became interested in that sense because much smaller numbers, but I suppose only about 20,000 serve in the Confederate Army, or, and I've kind of estimated that. The Irish patriot John Mitchell, who was pro-Confederate, said 40,000, but he was up in the numbers. for He had a reason for that. But, um, but they concentrated in towns and cities, so in places like New Orleans, in Charleston, Savannah, Richmond, uh, Alexandria, just across the river, you had, you had um, concentrations of Irish who do kind of the same things, form their own mm. ethnic units, um, and where you find out about them is, I mean, they're, they're in the newspapers around the time of secession and, and when the war begins. But the, the greatest source for me was the compiled Confederate service records, which are in this building and in the regional archives around mm -hmm. the country. Okay. Um, when I first started researching, they were on microfilm. So, right. And the, the microfilm room has moved around a lot. I was up somewhere upstairs <laughs> when I came here in the, early, floor, 90s, yeah. in the early 90s. Yeah. Um, but a lot of my research is from that. And, and actually... 
I, I think they're kind of connected. So the compiled conservatory are now avail available digitally, unlike all the union ones. All the Confederate ones are available online, as well as on microfilm here and in the regional archives. But um, in some ways, I've often wondered why the Confederate records are so extensive. Uh, and I think it's connected to the pension issue that the War Department in the 1880s and 1890s, when these pensions are gone, they're like, we don't want to give one to a reb. <laughs> so uh, we want to keep a list of any kind of you know, Confederate that ever existed so that we can cross-reference and say, no, you can't have a pension because you okay. actually fought on, fought on the other side. Okay. But that's been a boon to me as a, as a researcher yeah. in the late 20th and early 21st century. So um, David, you mentioned compiled service records, and Damien, you mentioned pension records. Can you say a little bit about what sort of information um, prospective researchers might find in those, in those files? Well, if you want to talk about the uh, I'll talk about the pensions after if you want to hit Okay, the I mean, the, compiled, the Confederate compiled service records are basically what a, a bunch of civil servants in the War Department gathered in the late 90s. They went through all the muster rolls that they had, which saved us the job of doing it. I mean, I've, I've messed with muster rolls. There's some of them are in state archives in the South, and they're just all over the place. But they went through and found every piece of paper, and then they fill out these slips, basically. F you know, So this person, Dominic Spellman, a, a soldier that I follow a lot, uh, an illiterate Irish laborer from Charleston, who served in the Irish Volunteers for the War, Company K for South Carolina. So it's done by regiment. You, you go look up Spellman in, in, in the, in the Fort, South Carolina, Fort South Carolina file on microfilm or online. And it basically has you know every, every few months where he is, if he's present, if he's wounded, what happened to him. If he was captured, he ended up in the... So they have all these slips of paper written out in the 1880s and 1890s, and now all microfilmed in a row. So you can kind of follow his soldierly career all the way through uh, it gets a bit fuzzy at the end because Confederate muster rolls kind of fell apart towards the end. But you'll often find ones literally at Appomattox or with Spellman's case where he was actually finally released. He was captured. He was finally released in June of 1865. And then other stuff, often sometimes letters, if they've come across letters um, for, for discharge of a number of Irishmen in the Montgomery Guards from, um, from Richmond who wanted to get out of the Confederate Army by basically saying... Um, you know, actually, I was only here, really. I wasn't planning to stick around, and I'm not domiciled in the Confederacy. I was only kind of passing through, so can I please be discharged? Uh, and so they got a bunch of friends in Richmond to say, oh, yeah, he never said he was going to stay. And, 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 and he, he was like he was a tourist, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there weren't many Irish tourists in the 1850s uh, living in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, although they were granted their discharge, um, um, in, in April of 18, 18, 1862. So yeah, so, the, so basically, they've, you know, the, the, the War Department put all these records together in files, which now were, were microfilmed, and I think um, maybe Jackie did some of that microfilming, and now are available digitally, which, which is great. Pensions. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. Uh, yeah, just to talk about, and it's the topic of this book, um, for, for anybody not aware of it, in, in, the, the pensions... Uh, they came out of the Civil War for Union soldiers. Um, were, they came, they were a result of an act of 1862 that Abraham Lincoln signed into law. And it was in order to give widows and men who had been debilitated or wounded in their service some sort of security as, as a result of their service. Um, and obviously, they were doing that at the time as a reward for, for you know, having given something to the war effort, but it was also in the context of that time a recruiting tool because there were men staying at home yeah. because their families w were relying on them and they couldn't go off to war um, and they wanted to show that they were going to look after them if anything happened to them. And so that's the, the genesis of the pension system, but it becomes this massive, massive um, amount of the federal budget. As the years go on, the Union um, veterans, many to things like the GAR, the Grand Army, the Republic, the Veterans Institutes, become incredibly powerful politically um, in 19th century United States. And the pensions that flow out of American Civil War service are absolutely colossal in scale. To a stage in the 1890s where nearly 40% of the entire federal budget of the United States is being spent on military pensions of one form or another. So we all know governments don't like to spend money unless they know you deserve it, right? It's not something that they're keen to do. They're not going to give it away for free. And so that's the genesis, really, of where the pension files become such great records. So for the soldiers ones, for guys who were fortunate enough to survive, they have to demonstrate their service. And the acts, as the years go on, kind of, they change a bit, you know, they might make it a bit lenient. You have to be 
showing that you were wounded in service, but then later old age becomes um, a factor. And so they effectively become the first old age pensions in the United States. Um, and so, so the, the, the soldiers' pensions are very, very good. They can give you great detail about a service in a guy's post-war career. But the ones I look at are of the men who die, who, who die either as a, as a result of their service or die in the years after the war, and their pensions are claimed by widows or their dependents. So it's either their wives, their mothers, their fathers, or dependents, uh, brothers and sisters, or minor children. So they're the class of people. And these are the richest files. Any of you who have not looked at these files, you have to look at them. They're just the most incredible documents you will ever come across. Whether your interest is military history or your interest is social history and you have no interest in military history at all, uh, they have something for everyone. And maybe, will I go through what's the kind of information in them? Or? Uh, sure, well, uh, one, yeah. one thing that uh, I was um, amazed by uh, having read your book, Damien, is um, the amazing letters that you found yeah. within these pensions. Why, why would there be letters within a pension file? It seems very bureaucratic place to find Absolutely. a very personal letter. So it all comes back, these people are only providing the type of information that they need to show the pension bureau that they are entitled to the pension, okay? okay? So a lot of it is affidavits. Um, so it gives you this huge spread of social history because I have my former employer is telling you that, uh, oh, actually my son always bought our groceries for years, and this is how much money he gave me. Um, the, they would have physicians, the military records are in there, family, friends, people are sending back to Ireland asking the local priest to send over a, um, the original marriage certificate. Absolute reams of, of information, all social history across decades. In some cases, people could not gather the information that they require. They couldn't find a certificate, and they couldn't find the, the, the piece of official documentation that the Bureau needed to be satisfied mm. that the person uh, was, was who they said they were, that they were associated with them. Mm. Um, and in that situation, people often handed over original letters written to them by the man who died. Um, and that's one reason for it. Another you get is that men often served under aliases. They assumed names to serve mm. in the military. And in those cases, for widows left behind, it was inordinately difficult for them to prove well, you say you were married to John Murphy, but John Murphy didn't serve in this regiment. That was John Sullivan. And so these people would then hand in the letters because often in the letters, the first letter would say, by the way, I enlisted under the name John Sullivan, so write to me, care of, and this is what they would do. Why would they serve under aliases? Lots of different reasons. It's, <laughs> it's something that inspires me. No, none of them are usually very good. Is that your uh, next question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, lots of different reasons. There, there, there's some examples. Um, pe people sometimes are uh, running away from other marriages. People are running away from other responsibilities, sometimes running away from other regiments. Um, okay. But there are, there are a class of men who clearly actually just do it. Um, I, it's almost like they just don't want the record there of oh. them. You know, a, a lot of it seems to be associated, some of it is to do with substitutes, um, and, and some of it do, do it when, when, they're, when they're drunk, when they're inebriated. So, um, yeah. there, there, but there is a, there's a huge range of, of reasons for it, and that's actually something I'm very keen to delve into. Mm -hmm. but, uh, some of these people, um, and it's quite poignant, a lot of the stuff, you know, these are fundamentally sad stories with these files. They contain the most information because of the, the lengths that the, the women in, in the main have to go to to prove their association. But every time you, you look at the first scan, which is the way I look at them, um, you know what the outcome of this is. You know what happens to these people, and it, it can be quite heartbreaking. So you see things in the files like... Um, a mother has handed over all the letters that her son wrote to her, mm. and they will say, please return these letters when you're finished. And because it becomes an official federal government document, once it's handed in, they, they never got them back. Mm. And fortunately for us, but you, you can imagine <laughs> the, right. the heartbreak for them at the time. They didn't have copiers to make. No, no, yeah. exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. But, um, well, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, is it worth it, like, it, 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 it's, just to delve into some of the type of things, that this is uh, one, it kind of speaks a bit to what David was talking about in relation to, to the South mm -hmm. um, and communications. Um, and I, I'm going to hopefully just dip in and out a, a little bit as, as we go on into the book. Um, and I picked 
The first one in honor of our moderator here is from Sligo, which is where his family are from. But it's, um, it's, it's a series of letters that were written. And again, it, naval letters are often forgotten, the guys who were in the Navy. And this is a guy called Patrick Finan, who was serving aboard a vessel called the USS Wabash. And he was on the, the, the South Atlantic blockading squadron. So these are the Union vessels that are lying off the coast of the Confederacy, preventing um, the Confederacy from sending out supplies and from, from supplies coming into the South, and that was kept in, in place during the war. Most of these guys' lives were dominated by extreme boredom. So what Patrick did was he wrote letters back to his father, who was a butcher in Sligo Town in Ireland, and really extensive, long, long letters. Um, and, and we do have this perception that these people never communicated. The people left Ireland, and that was it, never heard from again. And if the files show you something, it shows you that this really isn't quite true. Um, we have evidence even for people who are fully illiterate, who are still using written correspondence back and forth. But uh, we have this young man from Sligo who is on the Wabash off of South Carolina. And he's writing back to his father. And I'll, I'll just read out a small extract of one of the letters. And this is what he's asking him. Now, this tells you a bit about communications. Dear father, You'll make it your business to see Mr. Coggins and ask him if he's heard anything from his son, Michael. For I was told by a prisoner we got on board our ship that come from Charleston, and he told me he knew Michael Coggins, and that he got married, and shortly after, he enlisted in Charleston and is now stationed in James Island, the very place we are going to make an attack on. And by the way, give my respects to him and his daughter, Margaret. <laughs> so he's effectively asking his father across the Atlantic can he check with the neighbor to see if his son is a friend of his who's a confederate a few hundred meters away from him? Now, that's incredible. And I actually, the, David was talking about the, the, the confederate service records earlier on. I looked into it, and, and he was there. Uh, if you look at it, uh, Michael Calkin serves in Company D of the 3rd Palmetto Battalion, South Carolina Light, Infantry, Light Artillery, um, and later was moved over to a vessel called the CSS Chicora. And the CSS Chicora was where the crew for the Hunley were drawn from. So he would have known the guys on the Hunley. But just in that short extract, mm -hmm. you can see that's, that's, not, that's not the type of thing that, that fits with an image that these guys are gone and that's it. Uh, he's, he, he's able to write back to get information about what's happening up the road from him in the south. So. And, and this, this letter, if I'm remembering correctly, he and his father exchange newspapers, like local papers that would have been sent. So he was really quite... V very much touch. so. He was hearing about what the local dogs were doing to the sheep back in the streets yeah. of Sligo and everything. It was yeah. all, he is all of us like, get, getting, getting a great laugh. And some of the really good letters, a lot of the, a lot of the longest letters that you can find are, are sometimes in the union files because, mm -hmm. you know, they, they really don't have very much to do. Unfortunately for him, uh, he was involved a few months after this. The, the rest of the letters deal with him trying to remit money to his family so that they can come out to the United States. Um, a lot of that is happening. Um, but unfortunately, as happened, uh, it was one of the, the worst ways to go on these um, vessels that, that relied partially on steam for propulsion. Um, there was a, he was trying to fix the boiler, and there was a, an expulsion of steam that fatally scalded him. And he, it took him a couple of days to die, unfortunately. So, And his father, who never left Sligo, he claimed his pension in Sligo. His father never went to the United States never left Ireland, uh, and he was claiming his pension as a butcher on the streets of Sligo for the rest of his life. So it, it goes to show you the, the value of the records, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, David, do you find um, that sort of close connection where Yeah, I mean, you see it, I, you, you see it in, in all the letters. They're, they're inquiring about home, and, yeah. you know, I, as an immigrant myself who lived in the United States for 18 years, yeah. it's the thing, particularly your parents, my mother will tell me who's died, you know, who, uh, who's yeah, doing this. Yeah. If there's anybody within 100 miles of me when I lived in Charleston, you know, maybe he can, you can look him up. I'm like, he's in Atlanta. It's like five <laughs> hours of it. But, uh, Do you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we forget. We think how modern and sophisticated we are. But, uh, you know, they had the same, the same hopes and aspirations and concerns about, about, about home. Sure. I mean, one of my own ancestors went to Wisconsin and, and, and never came back. Um, and 50 years later, he writes a letter to my great-grandfather, uh, sorry, my great-grandmother sympathizing on the death of his brother. Mm -hmm. And he still can name all the fields that remind the townlands mm -hmm. on where he grew up 50 years later. He can mm -hmm. still reminisce in his house in Wisconsin. And, and that definitely come true in these letters in the pension files in particular. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's, um, I, I, I should, I, it would be remiss of me to point out 
these files relate to the American Civil War. So they're created by the American Civil War, but I always say they're not of the American Civil War because the information takes you through, it can take you through 70 or 80 years of these people's lives, mm -hmm. often into the 1920s. So the, often the last thing that you see is the, the receipts from an undertaker, some in Dublin, for example, where they're looking to recoup the cost of burying a pensioner. Yeah. But from an Irish context, we often right. think of these, these type of files from an American context, obviously, because they, they, they are U United States files. But right. these files are the most important documents relating to 19th century Irish social history available anywhere in the world because of the information in them. We have no major census information. You may, be, may or may not be aware of this. Some of our censuses were pulped, 19th century censuses were pulped, um, and a number of others were destroyed during our own civil war in the four courts in the 1920s. But even that aside, even with the paucity of our 19th century information, the fact that these files allow us to individually go down to the poorest level of Irish society, the people who couldn't write, the people who are lost to us, apart from an odd entry in a census. Mm -hmm. And we can completely expose so much of their lives, often in their own words, is an incredibly mm -hmm. valuable tool for Irish historians as well as for Americans. So if I were uh, an historian in Ireland wanting sources, I would likely yeah. come to the United States. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I might give you another example. Just, just um, it, it, again, it, it speaks a bit to the um, to the Irish aspect of these, um, and it, it's a it's a letter. These are my, my own family, uh, some of whom I believe are watching in Australia as we speak. But uh, my own family, who are from North Donegal, I'm from Limerick myself, but N North Donegal originally. Um, this is a family from a really rural part of North Donegal called the Fannet Peninsula. Now, this is still exceptionally rural. Um, and it's, it's a letter written from the Fanet Peninsula in 1869. And it goes through a pension agent in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a pension agent who interestingly is called Devitt, which is a northwest uh, of Ireland name for anybody who knows surnames. And Devitt does an awful lot of the Irish pensions uh, in Philadelphia. But I'll read it for you here. It says, Dear Sir, I confide in your honor that you will use all the efforts in your power to draw support for me and my old and tender husband, John Coyle, in lieu of our son Hugh Coyle, and our only one son, that left us helpless and tender to purchase a support for us in America. And while he lived, he sent us a help of support, but alas, he is gone. And we have no support, for I am doubtful the landlord will eject us out of our bit of land that we held under him, for he wants it with others to put black cattle to graze on it. I place all my confidence in the good and generous government of the United States of America that they will take my case to a kind consideration for a support. Yours respectfully, Eunice Coyle. So you have a woman here in her 70s whose son, his son, if you were interested in, in it, was in a Pennsylvania Cavalry Regiment who was taken prisoner during the Army of Northern Virginia's retreat from Gettysburg and dies as a prisoner of war in Andersonville. And she... You know, pension, when people are looking for these type of pens, pensions, the widow's pensions, like they're never happy stories, but these people are often trying to over-egg the pudding. There's nobody saying, well, we're not too bad really, but we still need the money. There's nobody saying that. <laughs> so I read this initially and I said, well, they're talking... Sorry, what was that expression, yeah. over-egg? Over-egging yeah. the pudding. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> An Irish one, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't heard that. I'm sorry. <laughs> in, any, in any event... Um, I thought she might be exaggerating when she's saying, ah, she's saying we're going to lose our home and they're going to put black cattle on it. But what she then does in the file in the next sheet is the original eviction notice given to her by this notorious landlord in Donegal, the third Earl of Leitrim, who a few years later met a fairly grisly end at the hands of three of his tenants, by the way. But uh, <laughs> the full... <laughs> the full... The full, um, the full eviction notice is there, the, uh, which is in itself an incredible document. So this shows you that it is far more than... The only real connection that that story has with the United States is that her son died there. It's almost an incidental aspect of that pension file. So, so in, in that story alone, we're learning about this Irish couple who survived the famine and are now trying to negotiate their way through... Um, their landlord's um, decision making and hoping that the US government can provide some assistance for their deceased son. Precisely. That's and, amazing. And, and it's, it's one of the great things about the files. Um, it, it's, it's, it's drawing my mind to another one that I might just read a very short extract mm -hmm. out of. But um, 
one of the things about these files that I really, really like is that it allows us to, to often take people from before the famine mm -hmm. to after it. So there's another story in the book, um, they're the Madigan family, they're from North County Kerry, um, mm -hmm. from a place called Causeway. And it's a really sad story. It's one, the pension files, I was told recently by a leading famine historian, actually David would, would know about this, um, that the, um, it was a shame, people had a, a shame if they lost somebody in the famine and they wouldn't speak about it often. So you never really see, even though a lot of people in the pension files must have had people who directly died in the famine, they never say it. I found two references in all the time um, that, that I've been looking at them. But one of them is this family, the Madigans. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this woman, Mary Madigan, loses her husband to the famine. So he dies in the famine. And it forces her to take her children and emigrate to the United States. And from an Irish perspective, we'd often kind of go, oh, well, that's sad. And off she went, and the streets were paved with gold, and that was great. Um, but that's not what happens to her. She remarries, as is often the case, because she was reliant. Um, you often see quick remarriages in this period. Mm -hmm. And she moves, uh, she moves out of New York fairly quickly with her new husband, who, who proceeds then to violently abuse her mm -hmm. over the course of a number of years. Uh, and eventually, uh, it gets so bad that her children, who are back in New York, her eldest son, um, e effectively rescues her and takes her back to New York um, so this is bad enough. She's lost her husband. She has this. And then her eldest son happens to be in the 69th New York State Militia. And the 69th New York State Militia head to Bull Run, the first major battle of the war, and he is there mortally wounded. So you have this sequence of events. But I, I just want to, to quickly uh, say, you would think that everybody at home would be kind of thinking, God, she's really had it fairly rough. Um, but she gets this letter from Tralee in County Kerry, which is almost certainly from her sister. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she is writing to her sister because she's looking for her original marriage certificate from North Kerry. So that's the reason behind the, the letter. But anyway, this is this, this unfortunate Mary Madigan's um, sister writing to her. And she starts giving out to her because she sent her own son over to her called Jimmy. And she says, Dear sister, I'm sorry I ever sent you Jimmy, Jimmy and lost a few pounds to him that I did to be the means, of, means, as they'd say in Kerry, the means of sending him to the war. So he's enlisted as well. I would want what I lost to him very badly now myself, for I am getting into bad health every day. I am laid up at present with a scurvy in my feet, and I fear I will have to leave my place in consequence of them. Her place is her, she's a servant. I have a very good place at present if I could keep it. I am living with Mr. George Hillard. Dear sister, I thought I would have got some assistance from you and Jimmy before now. Ye have made, as I thought, faithful promises, but slow performances. So there, fundamentally, you have the issue. Yeah. If you get out, no matter what happens to you mm -hmm. after your emigration, if you have got to America, you have an obligation on those who you left behind. In, in, in that woman's defense, she does start her letter by saying, I hope you get a lot of masses said for, for your son. But, uh, you, you, you are seen to have a financial obligation to those at home who do not have the good fortune of being in a new country. And, and so do the records, both uh, Union and, and Confederate, do they, do they show that there is money being sent back uh, to help? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, the Confederate records are just not as extensive. They don't have a national pension system. They get state pensions right. later on. And, and by that stage, uh, a lot of Irish have left the South and, and moved out, um, moved other places or, or just... Stop, stop going there. But mm -hmm. I have some examples of, of um, and these are in actually the Archdiocese of Mobile in, in, the, in the priest and the bishop's letters. Um, bishop John Quinlan, he's from Cork. He was the Bishop of Mobile when the Civil War was on. Mm -hmm. And he was what you might call a substitute broker. So he, he would basically, a lot of Irish would be paid as substitutes when the Confederate draft comes in in, in April of 1862. So they would be paid to take somebody else's, a rich man's place. But of course, they were worried about these, these so-called bounty jumpers that would sign up and then take the money and disappear. And you were drafted. You're still on the hook to show up and, and enlist. So what he would do is he would hold the money, the $200 or whatever. The, 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 uh, the substitute would get 50. Uh, and then he would hold it to give it to him when he returned from service. Or if he died in service, then the, 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 the substitute left instructions. And a lot of times it was, please send it to my wife, often in the northern states, or send it to my parents back in Ireland. Oh, and here's a, here's a few bucks for the church as well. For the, you know, here's, you know, take 10 for yourself. And, and, and uh, have one for yourself, as we'd say. And then, and then uh, send it, send it, send, but send it back to Ireland. So here they are in Mobile, Alabama, about to join the Confederate Army. 
and he's thinking about their families back in County Kerry or County Cork, or relatives in Illinois and in New York and places like that as well. I mean, just the Irish are so mobile, you know, a, di a diasporic people staying in contact with, with, their, with their friends and family in, in other parts. Again, it, it's often hard to trace, but it's through military records, it's through the, the wars yeah. that these poor people are suddenly brought into the system uh, beyond the census. I mean, when I was looking at Irish people in the South, the first place, I went to the census, and that was great, and particularly after 1850 when they list where, where people are born and mm -hmm. give women and children's names and not just a head of household. Right. But again, I had a bunch of statistics. It's hard to get them to, sp to hear their voices. Yeah. And it's through these, particularly these pension files, but it's through military service often that, that they're brought into the purview of the government in the 19th century, which had a lot less effect in people's lives than it does today. Uh, that we finally hear poor people speak, often yeah. written by somebody else if they're illiterate. They, yeah. They'll have somebody else write the letters for them and then have somebody to read the responses, back, there, yeah. the responses back to them. So this is why it's such a huge source, particularly for the study of Irish history, even though it's based in this building here on Pennsylvania yeah. Avenue. Yeah. It's it. It's, uh, just, just, just on the illiteracy thing, because it really it's something that massively interests me, uh, illiteracy fundamentally changes how you perceive a letter so for us, a letter is a personal, private mm. piece of correspondence. That, of course, we're all sending emails now. But anyway, when we used to write letters, for anybody who still does, it's because, but privacy in terms of letters depends on literacy. So you have to think about a lot of these letters. And you can see it through the pension file. So you will see, say, a range of letters. There might be eight or 10 letters. You can see different hands. So you know it's not the same person writing it. And often people will be, some of the affidavits might be, I was the person who wrote her letters or read her letters. So you have to imagine these letters coming back from the front and being read in, in a communal setting where there's a number of people um, often listening to, to what's being said. So I, I think it fundamentally changes. Mm -hmm. So things, for example, in the files, like news being broken that somebody has been killed and the details of it mm -hmm. aren't necessarily something that you would have privacy in relation to. It could be your next door neighbor who is telling you that that's happened. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it might be worth just having another look at one of these, if that's okay. Yeah. Please. Um, um, yep. One of the, the great things, one of the many great things about these letters that you found, Damien, is sometimes the, the spelling is very phonetic. Um, so you can actually um, hear the, the what we in America would call the accent. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. So it, it's very great to have, have you um, read them Oh, aloud. read them, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, to practice your Donegal accent. Yeah, I'll have to. I'll have to get the Donegal accent <laughs> yeah, down a bit please. better, yeah. But um, we were talking there about how often the, the, to, it's one of the only places these people's voices are, are heard, okay? Um, when you're fortunate, some of them are actually in the first person. So you have people who would never... Uh, be otherwise recorded, who you were hearing their actual voice uh, written down. And, and often it, it's the women, um, which is a, is a major aspect of these files. And I'm going to read this uh, extract for you. And it's a woman who was very unfortunate. Her, her, uh, a lot of them were very unfortunate. Um, she, she, was, she was from Monaghan, um, and she had been married there in 1830. And her son had been killed in the 90th Illinois Infantry, Chicago's Irish Legion, in the attack on Missionary Ridge in 1863. But she was going into her pension office um, in, from her hovel on the prairie outside Chicago, where they made a living by cutting hay for the market. Mm. Uh, and she marched into her pension agent's office, where the pension agent wrote a letter saying that this woman is sitting in front of me in tears looking for her pension because she has an invalid son and a husband on his deathbed. He was dying of stomach cancer. Uh, but they, she gave an account which starts in 1830, and then she charts the history of all 13 of her children. Um, and so I'm just going to read that for you. She says, I was married December 25th, 1830 in Ireland to my husband, Patrick Murphy. I have never owned any property except my wearing apparel, and I've had no other means of support than my own labor when in health, my husband's labor when he was able to work, and the labor of our two sons, James and Michael Murphy. I have given birth to 13 children, John, the oldest in 1851, left me in Ireland and emigrated to America, probably to some southern state, and I have never since 1851 seen or heard from him. James II emigrated with me in 1853 and has always lived with me, unmarried, has done nothing by reason of pulmonary consumption during 10 years past, more than enough to pay for his board at home and clothes. Mary came in 1851 with John to America, 
worked as a house servant till her marriage about 1858 to Thomas Hudson. He ha has had seven children and neither she nor her husband have contributed to my support, nor can they, having all they can to do to support their family. Anne, my fourth, is unmarried, consumptive, works out as a house servant, does and can do nothing towards my support. Nor can Catherine, my fifth, nor her husband, John Whalen, who live in Texas at Houston, nor are they able to contribute to my support. Michael, my seventh, was a soldier, born in October 1842 and killed when 21 and one month old. Peter, my eighth, was born and died in Ireland in 1846, during the famine, by the way. Patrick, my ninth, died in 1864 at 16 years of age. Another, Peter, born in 1850, died in 1868 and was my tenth. Jane, my eleventh, was born in 1853 and has lived in Texas with Catherine since she was 14 years old. Uh, you can check the census for those women and they were working as dressmakers, just as, a, as an aside. Francis, my twelfth, was born in 1858 and Robert, my thirteenth and last, both live at home but are both too young to contribute towards my support. My husband and James and Michael helped support me by keeping a cow and raising a few vegetables, but chiefly by cutting and hauling prairie grass or hay to Chicago Hay Market where they were, when they were well. Um, it, she goes on there. I should note that it was, it was noted here. She, she's saying why they can't support her because that's why she, she needs to get the pension. Yeah. But it was also noticed that she, uh, the pension agent said that she was broken down from having, debilitated from having born 13 children. She had a prolapsed uterus, which is, is sometimes um, a factor with that, and also had a large, um, large um, cyst on her neck. So she was really in a very, very bad way looking for that pension. Yeah. But, you know, we would never hear any emigrant's voice in that way, a woman who couldn't write if her yeah. son had not been killed in action on Missionary Ridge. So oh, that's the type that's of amazing. information you get. So we get, we get all this family history um, and in this case, particularly, we get a mother's perspective. And I guess in many of these, since they're widows' pensions and dependents' pensions, but uh, we get a lot of, uh, of women's and, and mothers' uh, perspectives. Is that what you found? As you're going Absolutely. Through? And I know, David, you've, you, you, you were discussing this before about the, um, the, the, the trying to find a women's voice in 19th yeah. century Irish history. Yeah, I mean, not just in Irish history, but in yeah. the story of Irish America. It's, yeah. it's predominantly the story of, of men and, yeah. and, and of... We talked earlier about secrets and that, and then the Irish love, love the glory, even if it's glorious loss. So it's, we all know about Fredericksburg, but not about this woman's story, yeah. about her yeah. son, son who died. But I mean, the story of Irish women in America is, 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 is hard to tell. I mean, Hesia Diner's written a great book called Aaron's Daughters in America, and Ruth Han, the late Ruth Ann Harris and Janet Nolan did some work, but they're small books, you know, because we, we can't hear their voices. Again, we look at the stats and they worked as maids and the, the, the census, but I think this source will be yeah. an amazing, is an amazing source yeah. for, for finally letting Irish women, not just f from Ireland, but Irish American women, yeah. to tell their story properly. Because the, fi the files themselves really are, even though they're a military file, which and turns a lot of people off straight away, you know, um, th they're about women fundamentally. I mean, that's the bulk of these yeah. files relate to widows uh, mm -hmm. or mothers. They're the two largest groups who are claiming them. And so you were, you were reading their affidavits in almost every case. Um, and, 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 and further to that, I suppose, what we see for a lot of these women is the problems that, that were endemic in not only Irish-American society, but society at large in the 19th mm. century. So uh, a lot of these women, and there's some stories in the book in relation to this, were, were pursued rather vigorously, um, hounded, in fact, by the Pension Bureau, uh, be because you weren't allowed, for example, to re remarry and still claim your pension. So the Pension Bureau wanted to make sure if there was any hint that you might have been uh, inappropriate with the man at any point in time, they would send out examiners and they would really go after you, right? And of course, this is terribly unfortunate for the women themselves, but in those instances, you have huge reams of information, of interviews and everything, phenomenal stuff. Another one, and again, I might, I might go back to the book for this, uh -huh, sure. Uh, relates, relates to alcohol abuse, which we see um, all, all throughout the files, unfortunately. Um, and there, there's one family, the Martin family, um, the, the father of the family had been captured at Reeb Station and died a prisoner of war. But again, almost incidental to, to, to the actual story, they're a family from, from Derry originally. And the mother developed um, the, the disease of alcoholism. 
and the file relates to a series of investigations that took place as her eldest son tried to get the minor, his, his two minor siblings who were both under the age of 16, their pension redirected to him because his mother was spending it on drink. And they were living in tenements in New York. So again, how many accounts do we have out of tenements in New York? But this is the son um, talking about his attempts to try and get his mother to stop drinking. And he says, I two or three times attempted to live with her and tried to induce her to keep house and take care of the family. But in each instance, after getting such pension, her pension money, she would leave home and refuse to contribute to their, his siblings, share of such monies towards the support, education, and benefit. Her intemperate habits have prevented her from giving to either of the children such care and attention which they reasonably required. The youngest daughter, um, in that family, who was about 12 um, at the time all this was happening, remembered having to spend the whole night in an outhouse behind a tenement because I could not remain with my mother when under the influence of liquors, she would be harsh and cruel and compel us to seek for safety elsewhere. So we have their side of the story and we also have hers because they called everybody in and you can kind of imagine, were they all called in at the same time? Did they all see each other? And the examiner asks her, about what she's doing in relation to drinking. And she says, I'm not a drunkard, although I have occasionally drank a glass of intoxicating liquors. I have been in the habit too when our friends call on me of going out and purchasing perhaps 10 cents worth of common brandy and a pint of beer to treat my friends. I was once in the charity hospital to be treated for a sprained ankle. I had fallen on the ice and hurt my arm and foot. This occurred this winter about Christmas time. I am at present staying with Mr. Trainer and have no money, or what, no money whatever, having borrowed money enough this morning to pay our car fare. I had a glass of brandy this morning. The examiner afterwards annotated that, in fact, she, she was completely drunk during the interview, <laughs> effectively. So she, she does have a sad end, again, um, as is often the case. You can trace her through records where she tries to fight alcoholism. She goes back to Ireland for quite a while, but then it seems it ultimately does her in, but decades after we first yeah. encountered that problem. Yeah. Um, there's 35 stories in your book, Damien, and um, each one of them um, reads like it could be a film. And, uh, you know, off, I guess your next stop is Hollywood after this. <laughs> That's it. I'm, I'm just on the way. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and one that really st uh, stuck out at me, and you mentioned it to, to me earlier, uh, was the, the story of the woman searching for her son. Yes, could yes, you tell the us a bit of, Could you tell us a bit about that one? Yeah, well, it's the first story in the book, and it's, um, it, it's um, oh, oh, sorry, you're talking about the cars here. Yes, the, the, yeah, the, there's, there's, there's a number of women searching, actually. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. yes, there are. But yeah, the, um, the car family. Yeah, there's, this is a particularly good story because it brings, again, this whole idea of, of following people from Ireland. And it shows how you can pull not only the pension files, but information from a whole range of other sources together, like newspapers and everything that are available mm -hmm. digitally. Um, and the Cars were a family, another family from Derry, um, and they were what was called assisted immigrants. So the local um, authorities, they were so poor that they gave them the money to emigrate to the United States. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the mother is widowed, presumably the father died um, um, of, of some ailment. And she emigrates to the United States. I'm, I'm giving you the story now as it, as it is reconstructed. But she emigrates to the United States, where when she arrives in New York, she doesn't have the financial wherewithal to support her three sons. And so she has to put them into an institution where they are cared for while she seeks the work to get the money. By the time she gets the money, she gets her two youngest sons back, but her eldest son has been sent west to work on a farm in Illinois. And through searching newspapers after I'd initially looked at this file, I found an advertisement. People couldn't send text messages or ring or didn't have um, Facebook check-in back in these days. So, so they didn't, you know, if you wanted to find someone in this period, often what you would do is put an information wanted advertisement in a newspaper. And there's lots of these in, in Irish newspapers like the New York Irish American and the Boston Pilot. And she put an ad in um, looking for her son, Barney Carr was his name, looking for her son that I found then in the newspaper. Um, and he writes back to her uh, in early 1861, and he has enlisted in the Union Army. So we're able to, through other 
um, sources trace all of this story, this backstory to Barney. And Barney begins to write. So he has not seen his family, who he came over with, um, in nine years. But again, I suppose fundamentally, these are created as a result of war. And there are letters in this. Um, there's a section, for example, that examines how people, how people found out about war, um, about death, etc. Um, but this one is, is worth reading. For any of you who are familiar with Georgia, this letter was written on the line in Kennesaw Mountain. And I'm going to read it all to you because it shows the impact. This is a very young man, the impact that war has. Headquarters, 79th Regiment, Illinois Volunteers, camp in the field in front of the enemy breastworks, and they are shooting at us all the time. This date, June the 20th, 1864. Dear parent, once more I take the pleasure of writing to you a few lines to let you know that I am still alive yet. As I suppose you are well aware that Sherman's army has been a fighting ever since last May and that I am still in his army. So as I have not wrote to you in a good while, I thought you would be uneasy about me and thought that I would write to you a few and let, and then the letter stops, okay? And about two or three spaces down, it starts again. And he says, dear mother, I have had to stop writing we are lying on the line of bat battle, and there are 12 pieces of cannons in front of us, and they are a-shelling the Rebs, and that draws the Rebels' fire, and it is a horrible place to be in. Cannonballs are a-flying thick around us, and the shells are a-screaming in the air and through the woods, cutting the timber and earth in all directions. But thank God, Mother, I am still safe and unhurt. But how long I may still remain so, I can't tell anything about that yet. God only knows how long it may last, I am sure I can't tell anything about it now, that by the grace of God I still live yet and am well and hearty in the bargain. And I hope when this few lines reaches you that they will find you all well and doing well. Dear mother, these are hard times, nothing but fighting every day and killing of men. I am getting tired of it. But then I want to see them keep those rebels moving to Atlanta, and I guess that is the only way of putting down this rebellion, and the sooner it is down, the better it is for them that lives to see it. But mother, pray for me that I may live to see it over and live to see you all. So mother, I want to see you before I die and I want to see all of the Carr family. Right, so that tells us a couple of things. I always, I struggle reading them. It tells us a couple of things. It tells us, for example, this guy cares about the union. He's fighting for the union. He's very strongly um, motivated by fighting for the union. Um, but when we have the backstory with it, with the impact that that war has had, when we have the full backstory of what's happened to that individual family with the assisted immigration, so tragedy in Ireland, um, separation in the United States, they don't meet up, and then here we have it. And a week later, the Union Army assault the Kennesaw Line in what's the, the biggest disaster, uh, really, of that campaign. And the 79th Illinois Infantry lose one man dead, and it's Barney Carr. So he, he never gets to see them again. And that fundamentally um, is what these files have always at the end of them. But they, they, I, supp I suppose through, through what the awful, awfulness that occurred to them, they've given us such an incredible rich source that we can look at now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Damien, I'm, I'm intrigued by the title of, of your book, The Forgotten Irish. Um, how did you come up with that title? What was your thinking? Yeah, it's something I think both David and I will have a bit to say on here. Oh, we, have yeah. <laughs> we have a soapbox. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, title, the title, and it's explained the epilogue for anyone who's confused, because a, a, a number of people have actually written to me and gone, but these people aren't forgotten. What are you talking about? My grandfather or great-grandfather fought in the war, and we don't forget them. The title, this book is originally published in Ireland, remember. Uh, and the Irish who fought in the American Civil War are most certainly not forgotten in the United States, but they most certainly are forgotten in Ireland. Um, it's quite staggering to be, to be frank about it. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier on, it's the biggest war we had along with World War I. And for most of what is currently the landmass of the Republic of Ireland, it was the biggest war in our history, yet there is virtually no awareness of it at all. Uh, it's something I've been trying to change over the last number of years. Um, and we do have an issue, David will, will probably speak to this as well in a moment, um, where Ireland is very good um, about projecting the fact that we are a, a nation of immigrants, that it's, it's diaspora. And we're always very keen for all of you to come back and spend your money in Ireland. <laughs> and we will, we will discuss that. And indeed, you can look at many. You only have to, if you look back at our, 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 
Ireland's speeches over the years in the United States, you see this. There's a consistent mention of Ireland, 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 Ireland. But throughout the, the, the 150th of the American Civil War, there was almost no mention of any, by any Irish person over here of the, the American Civil War, by our, I mean Irish politician, uh, of the American Civil War, or of the impact, or of the emigration. Um, and I would feel quite strongly about it, because the reason that our leader can sit um, in the White House, um, one of the only, a tiny country, the only reason they can do that is because of what Irish immigrants did in the 19th and 20th centuries. That is the privilege that was bought by the Irish immigrant community. And I feel as a nation, we have to do an awful lot better about not, as one historian puts it, um, having a tearful farewell at the port and then forgetting everybody once they leave, unless they're, they're second or third generation people come back to spend money. Mm -hmm. We have to fully engage with the history, um, and it comes at a cost. No Irish historian that I'm aware of or no, no, has ever looked at these files, and yet there are greatest 19th, I'm utterly convinced that there are greatest 19th century social um, uh, resource, and that is because we don't look outward. We don't look at things like the American Civil War and recognize it. And, and I know yeah, you I mean, we, ha we actually have now, in, in the change to the Constitution after the Good Friday Agreement, they changed Articles 2 and 3. In mm. Article 2, you can look it up, there's a, there's, a, there's a charge there to cherish the diaspora, to cherish those as, as, as Irish people who left in, uh, over the generations. And, and the Department of Foreign Affairs has come up last year with a yep. lovely new document, yep. nice shiny document. You can look at it on PDF online or get it yourself about cherishing the diaspora. But, but they don't seem to want to recognize the history of the diaspora. Again, unless it affects Ireland, we had a, a great commemoration of 1916. They spent a million euros on it. Uh, but myself and Damien tried to have an official event in Ireland, a conference maybe to bring um, Irish American scholars, people who study Irish America, to come to Ireland. And there is, you know, when you talk to people in Ireland, you know, they're fascinated yeah, absolutely. about it. But yeah, absolutely. We tried to get our government. We wrote to ministers. We wrote to politicians. And eventually, I, I, I got a, a kind of a gripe put in the Irish Times. Um, we had a journalist put a gripe in there, and somebody, the Department of Foreign Affairs, said, "Oh, we should do something about that." And we finally had a talk in 2015, June, um, yeah. just before like the grand, you know, the, the 150th of the Grand Parade on Pennsylvania yeah. Avenue. So they got it in just before the end of the war. Yeah. But, um, but that was it, really. Like, yeah. And a kind of a small event, and we've, we've, you know, we've become, feel like we're banging our head against the wall with, yeah. with, with that and with yeah. these people. Yeah, there's an yeah, it's an obligation. Like, I mean, and you can just look back, and I have looked back at, our, for example, our own leaders here in the United States, where, for example, things in the White House in 1865, the things that were mentioned were that it was the 150th anniversary of the birth of William Butler Yeats, which is something we spoke about. It was also the 150th anniversary of, of thousands of Irish guys dying on American battlefields. Um, yeah, I, that one particularly galled me because I was like, William Butler Yeats is a great poet, but he didn't come out of the womb writing poetry. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Exactly. He was, yeah. So he was born in 1865. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. You know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. It was like. New, Year, New Year's Day, I was reading the Irish Times, I was home, and it was like, oh, the year of commemorations, and the, all the commemorations. William Butler Yeats' birth, not a mention of the American Civil War. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. So, shaking the paper. Yeah. Uh, so that one got me, you know, got, got us going to actually yeah. try again. It did, it did, uh, Try it another did. effort, which um, we might go down and see the on T-shirt later on. He's down <laughs> at the Willard Hotel right now, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. Anyway. Well, the, the, the stories are, they are amazing. Um, the details, you've heard just a, um, a little portion of them tonight uh, from, from David and from, from Damien um, are really quite riveting and uh, um, sad, but uh, deeply moving, um, deeply, deeply moving. So um, thank you for sharing, yeah. sharing I, all that. I would just like to conclude by acknowledging Please. that none of this would be possible for me to do, like I'm... I, I don't, I don't, I work in heritage, so I don't have much money, obviously. I couldn't have done any of this without the National Archives decision to, to digitize these files and the work, work of people like yourself, and Jackie particularly um, here, who, who has done incredible work behind the scenes to allow, like there, there's, there, there's well in excess, it's, it's about 140,000, is it, uh, files? Oh yeah, but uh, that are now scanned on, 148,000 are available. 
of these files online. So I've, I've, there, there's a lot more to go now because there is 1.28 million of them. So there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, but it's, it, it should be pointed out that these files are not just about Irish people. I've started to look at a lot of other ethnicities, but they obviously have already shown their value for African-American research, mm -hmm. particularly in relation to former slaves. Um, but all immigrant groups, and not even immigrant groups, people from different areas, they're just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. really, really and I'd like to add to that and just thank the work that the National Archives uh, does in general. Sure. So I, mm. I've been coming here since the, the early 1990s and mm -hmm. had some eureka moments from the microfilm room uh, looking through compiled service records and census. So yeah. the fact that these are preserved here and easily accessible and close to the metro uh, <laughs> is, is, uh, is, is really good for a poor graduate student, like, immigrant graduate student like myself yes. or, or, or as a professor. So I wanted to thank everybody for, for all the work that's been done over, over the years in preserving these records. For, for American history, but also exactly. for, for Irish history. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I'd like you to join me now just in uh, thanking David and, uh, and David. We, we do have time for questions uh, that you might have for, for either David or Damien. Um, there's microphones at either side. And uh, sir, I think you were first. Yes. Um, um, this question, um, I'm a college student here in the Washington, D.C. area, and, um, um, and Damien, I'm very much enjoying reading your book. I'm finding it to be very meaningful. Um, one of the most, um, for me, one of the most interesting things, for me, one of the most interesting aspects of the book is learning about the, is learning about the experiences of Cornelius. Um, also known as Khan um, Garvey. Garvey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and I also, of course, found the discussion about Cornelius and his mother, Catherine, to be interesting, um, the discussion this evening. Um, my question is, what do you think... Um, my question is... Um, what did you... Was there anything that you found to be particularly surprising when learning about um, about Cornelius's story and his family's experiences. Yeah, so ju just on, on this Garvin story, you, this is the reason I kept the media rights to this book. It's the first chapter in it, and I, I, it's, it's one you need, to, you, need, you need to get the book to, 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 <laughs> to, to, to read. But um, it's effectively a woman whose son who, ha who has a disability, he has a mental disability, is stolen and sold into the Union Army. And she seeks him out um, over the course of, of a long, long time. And it's quite, quite, it's, it's incredibly compelling because it has all the actors on the stage. Abraham Lincoln is involved and Fernando Wood, um, all these type of, of figures. But I'll tell you what the most interesting thing about that story was. I initially wrote a version of that story on my website. And the last thing I found about the Cornelius Garvin story was uh, um, Cornelius Garvin's mother went home and died in East Limerick. And uh, somebody wrote to the mayor of Troy in New York in um, the 1940s, uh, that's where they, they moved to, from Limerick, and said, oh, I have a load of these documents and things. Um, some, one of them is a letter from Abraham Lincoln and stuff, you know, just have it at home. Um, and I'm looking to sell it. And there was no other record of that. And then I, um, I put out an appeal, and a number, uh, a number of years, um, um, uh, sorry, just last year, when I'd finished writing the chapter for the book, um, I was contacted by an Abraham Lincoln library woman called Jane, Jane Gastineau, who works in a, in the Link, a Lincoln um, library in the Midwest, and they had them. They had them all, and she scanned them all for me, and it included a full um, degree of information about um, his early days and the Lincoln letter and all of the efforts to try and get him. Um, I suppose what really surprised me most about it is that it happened at all. I, I wasn't aware that it could happen. The officer changed the boy's name to a German name, and she kept looking for him. Um, I'm not going to give away what happens, but you know what the content of the book is about. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it is the film out of the book, I think, maybe. Yeah, but thanks. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Thank you for your question. Uh, yes, sir. Um, realistically, since these are f documents that are filed to obtain the pension or to keep the pension going, do you find that the, what they're filing is usually pro-war, or do you actually see complaining about the war itself, or do, or do they not, do they sanitize because they don't want to be cut off? 
okay, they, they rarely complain about the war, well, never really. Uh, the, the type of place where you might get their honest opinion is in the letters of the original soldiers, so, which are written, um, if you like, in the moment. Um, and, and one of the other interesting things about the letters that maybe they, they, they have, that letters that might be handed sometimes into, into other collections don't have is that they're not sanitized in any way. Uh, a lot of people are discussing things that you know they would never have wanted to get into the public domain because at the end of it, like people are talking about their love lives sometimes, um, but at the end, the, the soldier might have written, by the way, this is my alias. And so his wife had no option but to hand that letter in to get the, so you, you get a, an honesty in them um, from that degree. Uh, not really otherwise, they're all saying that, uh, you know, they have to go through the standard team, that they never did anything for the, the baddie South, and they were always great for the Union and everything. Um, you do encounter a thing in the, around the, in the early 1890s, all the foreign pensioners' uh, pensions were, were stalled because of a change in the legislation, which meant, and there's a couple of stories in the book that are affected by this, that meant that you had to approve the citizenship of the person who you... you uh, who, who had served. And of course, if you were a widow living in rural Ireland, whose husband might have gone over with the specific intention of fighting in the war and was never a citizen, you can't do that. And then you have letters that are written directly to the President of the United States, sometimes by the guardians of poor houses in Ireland, there's examples of that in the book, um, or by the press uh, saying, this is a disgrace that these women have given their husbands to this war and that you're not now supporting them. And actually the government reeled back fairly quickly on that policy. Mm. So. But otherwise, no, they, they told the line to get the money. You're not going to rock the boat, like. Questions? Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Damien and David, thank you very much for a very entertaining and informative uh, talk. Uh, at the very beginning of your talk, Damien, you talked to us, uh, you mentioned uh, the know-nothings. And I know that when the Irish came here, they suffered from an ex you know really rabid uh, nativist uh, sentiment here in the United States. I wondered if that carried over into their war service and in their ability of their widows and uh, um, family members to obtain pensions afterwards, both from the Union and the Confederate side. And what happened during the war service? Were they, did that nativist sentiment uh, pervade there as well? Do you want to go on the Confederates first? You, you go first. Okay, okay yeah. yeah. Um, you, you actually see it sometimes in letters, what they say, like, that. There was always a feeling at home that the Irish Brigade were exposed to issues in relation to the Know Nothings, that they were put in the front line because of it. But there, there really isn't any evidence for that. They just happened to be in the Second Corps, which was a bad corps to be in. It was great if you wanted glory, but not great to be in if you wanted to stay alive. Um, I did come across one letter that was very interesting. That's not actually in this book, but it's, it's on the website. You check out the website, too. Uh, but the, the, um, it's, it, where it's one of the Irish Brigade soldiers after Fredericksburg is saying, these guys just keep putting us in effectively because they don't like us because we're Irish Catholics. Um, and so that perception does sometimes come through, but it's, it's a whole other, there's a whole other angle on this that, that we haven't really had got into tonight and don't have time to get into, but in relation to, for example, the I Irish race relations with African Americans, mm -hmm. which obviously, and that's something that you see in the file as well, really important documentation in relation to that. Um, there, you, you occasionally come across, um, there's one letter where, it's not, again, not in the book, in this book, but where um, one soldier um, from St. Saint, Saint Louis is saying, um, uh, oh, I was glad to hear that the Irish guys, the Irish guys who were rushing to the British ambassador to try and get, uh, to try and not have to serve in the army were all, were all Protestants and not Catholics. Because the Catholics wouldn't be up to that sort of stuff. So, and of course, that was absolute rubbish. Like, but that, so you occasionally get that type of stuff. So it, do, it does sometimes come into it. You see it a bit. There, there is a tension a bit after, after the war. I mean, mm. there is the Irish Brigade, and, but then, you know, Marr resigns, and then there's the draft riots, and yeah. people like George Templeton Strong made very famous in, in Ken Burns' documentary who <laughs> says terrible things about yeah. the Irish. And, and they feel actually they're being slighted a bit. D David Cunningham has to actually write... The, the history of, of it, yeah. A history yeah. of it, because he yeah. said, you know, you've forgotten about us. And in, mm -hmm. in the Grand Army of the Republic, the, the, the Union Veteran Organization, the Irish often set up separate camps, you know, mm. um, partly because the GAR is kind of an arm of the Republican Party and, and the, the Irish are pretty much Democrats. But there, there, there is a religious tension. Yeah. In the South, it's less so. I mean, there is no nothingism in the South. It's particularly strong in the Upper South and in places like New Orleans where it's anti-immigrant more than anti-Catholic. Um, but ultimately, no nothingism fails in the South because the Irish are still white. 
and, and so therefore, you know, th there is that kind of racial unity that, that, that trumps mm. ethnic and, and religious differences. So that after the war, um, Irish veterans are accepted into the United Confederate Veterans. They don't have their own, their separate caps. And when eventually Confederate state pensions come, you know, Irish people apply for it, and they often appeal to their former officers. They have to yeah. do the same kind of thing to show that they had served. So I, I have actually one that's in the, it's, it's, I think called the, the Association of the Army of Northern Virginia, which was a predecessor of the United Confederate Veterans. And he's a Confederate Marine, actually, uh, uh, an Irish guy. And he writes to his former officer, say, can you vouch for me? I'm poor now. And he actually sends his picture, actually. Do you remember me? Uh, and his Confederate commander says, I do remember you, you're a great soldier, and he gets a bit of a, a stipend from the, from, from the, from the association. Um, the, I mean, the Irish make that choice in the South to, to go with white supremacy and with the, the, the dominant, ultimately, redeemer, redeemer side. They're a bit in play right after the war because they pretty much accept that when the war is over and embrace kind of, oh, we're back to the United States again. Well, we were Confederates, now we're back to the United States. But ultimately, they oppose radical, radical reconstruction and and then become part of the so-called solid, solid South. I would just briefly add as well, and Professor Susanna Ural has done some great work on this, about how the war, there's a big perception, for example, particularly in the North, that the, the service, Irish service in the war in and of itself is what got the Irish more accepted into American society. And, and Professor Ural argues, and I fundamentally agree with her on this, that that wasn't the case. Yeah. Um, because you can see Thomas Nast writing in, doing incredible mm -hmm. cartoons in 1867, for mm -hmm. example, after the, 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 um, the, the St. Patrick's Day um, riots in, in New York. And because of the draft riots and everything, that almost that the, that they had lowered what they'd done in the war. But where I think you really see it is that they, this battle for the memory of the war that you see in the, in the latter part of the 19th century, that you see in the South that David's work has shown the, the Irish getting involved, they're more Confederate than the Confederates in the 19th century. And all of these Irish histories and throwing up the Irish Brigade monuments and stuff like that, that they really kind of show with the later waves of immig immigrants coming in, hang on boys, we were here then and we fought in the war, we did our bit to save the Republic. So, yeah. did, did the Union ones uh, join the GAR? Were they welcome there? No, I mean, they, they did join the GAR, and, and, but they ha often had their own Irish camps, you know, the, the Thomas exactly. Marr, yeah. Thomas Marr, yeah, you know, um, camp rather than integrated in, in the UCV. Of course, there's a lot less Irish Confederate veterans than there are uh, Irish Union veterans, but they just join, join their normal, the normal camps. And some actually are named for Irish veterans. The Dick, the Dick Dowling camp in Houston was a famous Irish soldier uh, from Houston, Texas, and won this battle called the Battle of Sabine Pass. The actual UCV camp in Houston is called the Dick Dowling camp, named for an Irish officer from, from County Galway. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Could you share another story that did not make the book? Uh, a story <laughs> that didn't make the book? On the spot there. <laughs> um, um, yeah. There are literally hundreds of them. I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head. There's... Um, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a good one now because we're on St. Patrick's Day of the 9th Massachusetts, a soldier in the 9th Massachusetts who, um, who is writing home. Um, and I, I often like when they discuss events that you know about. So for seeing as it's St. Patrick's Day, um, St. Patrick's Day in 1863 in the Army of the Potomac was one of the most famous events in the history of the Army of the Potomac because the Irish Brigade put on this series of, of crazy events, of course, surround, driven by alcohol. Um, alcohol and gambling, effectively. They did things like you could climb up to the top of a greased pole or you were chasing a greased pig. The top of the pole would have a pass on it so that you get away because nobody could get up the top of the pole. So you'd be running, you'd have all the enlisted men running after greased pigs and you would have um, all the officers engaged in horse riding, um, the horse races. And there's a series of wonderful um, sketches of this event uh, freely available on the Library of Congress. Uh, website, if you go to it, where you can see sketches of that event. Anyway, it becomes really famous, but what this soldier in the night Massachusetts was an older man, and we have this perception that everybody who went off to war was young, and that most certainly was not the case. Um, there were plenty of guys who were, who were old. I think I've got one guy who was nearly 70 um, fighting. Um, what he was doing, I don't know. He made it as well. Anyway, but um, the, the, th this guy was in his 40s, and he describes St. Patrick's Day in a letter home. He's talking about the 9th Massachusetts, who are an Irish regiment, go over and kind of see what was happening. They have their own kind of version of the St. Patrick's Day events. But he, he, he's mentioning in his letters about how hard it is, that the army life is so hard. Like, And his son is a 
hospital steward in Rhode Island. Um, and as the summer comes in 1863, the uh, Army of the Potomac is being mobilized to start chasing the Army of Northern Virginia back up um, as the Army of Northern Virginia heads towards Gettysburg. And it's an interesting insight, this, because it gives you the, I, the pressure that was put under the men to get up to fight the Battle of Gettysburg. And if you're somebody, he was, a, he was a bit older and he was struggling under it, and he speaks about it, they were moving all the time, and he says, he, he effectively says, this is really having a huge effect on me, like that it's, 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 it's a big impact. Mm -hmm. And the Battle of Gettysburg is fought, the Night Massachusetts aren't really heavily engaged in it. Um, but anyway, a number of Night Massachusetts soldiers end up walking through the door of this hospital in Rhode Island. And the son recognizes that they're Knight Massachusetts. And he goes up to them and he says, you're Knight Massachusetts Regiment. And they say, yeah. And he says, oh, my father is in that regiment. And the guys in the hospital tell him that his father died mm -hmm. on the march up the way. And so again, like you have, you know, it's pr appropriate one for it. But like every one of them is, is like that. You can, you, can, you can do something a little different with every one of them when you're examining them. And they tell you something slightly different about, about the, the story. But IrishAmericanCivilWar.com. Hundreds of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I thank you both for your work and for your uh, presentation this evening. My question is, um, you know, keeping in mind that the, the U.S. Civil War ends 51 years before the rising, as you're following these letters um, during the war and, and the years and decades past the war, um, I'm, I wonder how much you see in there, if anything, um, about Irish nationalism, about the Fenians, uh, about the land war back in Ireland, about early Sinn Féin, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting because I have a whole theory based, <laughs> based around this. They really very rarely reference Ireland at all in their letters. Like it's, it's stark how, 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 how little. Now, some of them do. Um, there's a great one um, of a, a, a lad born in England. He was probably never in Ireland. Again, it shows you the Irish ethnicity. Born in England, uh, grew up there, and he is writing in 1862, around the time that there's a thought that maybe the, the Britain is going to recognize the Confederacy. And he writes that if the English recognize the Confederacy, uh, he'll kill every last one of them. Um, he doesn't care that he was born there because of what they'd be doing. Like, and he, he references his Irishness in reference to England there. Um, but my view from reading so many of these files is I think the, Fen the guys who were writing in the newspapers and everything who were often Fenian have kind of dominated the agenda a bit. The vast bulk of these people come over and they view their Irishness as an identity tag, but they don't necessarily have any intention of, of ever doing anything about it, that they see themselves more, way more as Americans than they do Irish. And a good example is that, right? People could really come home. If you, if, you, if you even kind of made half a fist of it over here, you had an opportunity to go back to Ireland. It wasn't like you, you could never go back. And we just spoke about how 40% of the federal budget is being spent on pensions. We spoke about how 180,000 Irish-born people were entitled or served in the army. In 1883, when they did a thing called the List of Pensioners on the Roll, there were 219 American military pensions being claimed on the island of Ireland. So you immediately see there, in that number alone, that people are not going back. And they're not going back, I think, because America is their country. And they, that, you, that dominates far more than any reference to Irishness. Um, but, so they will talk consistently about union, about the preservation of the republic. Whenever there's anything to be said, they'll talk about that. Um, and not, not, not necessarily about anything else. But where you see it, it, it remains unsaid for them because you can see in the type of people who are giving the affidavits, always it's Irish people, always other Irish people. So they're staying part of that Irish community. Um, a number of the more Fenians and everything we know, and of course we're in the anniversary, it's just gone of the 1867 Fenian Rising where a lot of, a place beside me, I was just writing about it last week, uh, a, a Coast Guard station was attacked in Cork in 1867 by a guy born and bred in New York. Never been to Ireland before, and he came as a Fenian, Irish-American, to engage in, 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 in that um, rising. But yeah, it's, 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 it's noticeable how, how little there is of it, uh, I would have to say. Thank you. And uh, we have time for one more question. Yes, ma'am. I also want to give a plug for your website. I love it. And uh, both Thanks. of you on Twitter, yeah. great. <laughs> um, now, I know we, it's understand, 
uh, understood that immigrants that would send remittances home, but I'm really fascinated by the idea of the United States government sending these pensions to across the seas. Were there any pushback uh, from American citizens that this is our money and that shouldn't be sent uh, abroad? Yeah, well, well, the biggest thing, and yeah, <laughs> it's good to see it, but the, the biggest thing is, the, um, is, is that um, 1890, when they try and cut, where effectively their actions are cutting anybody who isn't a citizen um, out of the pension file process. So they wanted, and a lot of Irish people enlisted, if you came to America and said that you intended to become a citizen, you became eligible for the draft, even if you weren't a, a full, fully fledged American citizen. And lots of people did come, as they're saying, they literally, there's, a, there's this scene in Gangs of New York that always annoys me, where you have all these kind of clueless Irish people hopping off the boat and then have kind of been duped into joining the Union Army. Whereas we know, you can see that an awful lot of these people intentionally leave Ireland to enlist and make money in the American Army. Um, but so a lot of those guys didn't have this citizenship and it. That, that was the kind of pushback. But I think people went crazy when that happened. Yeah. Like it, I mean, was, it was a time of crisis, the 1890s, yeah, economic yeah. panic. Grover Cleveland yeah. becomes president yeah. again, uh, who's a Democrat. And, you know, the first time he came in, the first Democrat since, you know, they yeah. considered traitors. He tried to give the, the flags back, you know, the Confederate battle flags back. He'd already blotted his copybook, as we say at home, with that one. And then, of course, he's, you know, Mr. Fiscal Conservative. He's, he's a Democrat. Um, so I, I'd say it's more about mo saving money, and yeah, it's it easier is, to pick on is. the foreign pensioners. Yeah, yeah. But of course, the Irish are, you know, traditionally Democrats. But in the 1880s, 1890s, they would they would switch back and forth. So that may have may have changed his changed his, his yeah. administration's mind yeah. or put pressure on Congress to to do yeah. it. So I think it's often the points of crisis that, you know, <laughs> that you blame the foreigners. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. absolutely. Easy scapegoat. <laughs> 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 well, I. I'd like once again to thank you all for, for joining us this evening and one more round of applause for joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks. Cool.